Hello, my name is Max. I have Asperger's Syndrome. This video is the fourth in a series of videos where I address the various symptoms of AS and give vivid examples from my own life. Briefly, before we begin, in case you haven't watched the first video and you're not inclined to, refer to the description box for my modus operandi. It'll only take a few seconds to read and might provide you with worthwhile context for the rest of this video and this series. For this video, I'll be addressing the issue of intimate relationships and how Asperger's Syndrome affects their attainment. If you want to experience the full educational value of this video, I recommend you watch the third video in this series titled Social Awkwardness. Although it is not necessary to do so, the issues I discuss in that video are directly intertwined with what I will be discussing today. Human beings. They are social creatures. They are a sexually dimorphic species. As a result, it is evident that intimate relationships are an inherent part of the human experience. They help us develop empathy, responsibility, and courage. They are challenging in a worthwhile way, and they enable us to mature for one only truly matures when someone other than yourself is more important. Given the fact that establishing partnership and propagating our genetic material has been the core of evolutionary history, there have been certain strategies developed over time by living beings to secure survival and reproduction. Some methods work better than others, and the ones that work best are the ones that work in harmony with our evolved framework of socialization. In case you're confused by that choice of words, allow me to provide an example. If you approach a member of the opposite sex and you creepily say, I love you, then you demonstrate kind of a pathetic eagerness that makes you seem like a less than ideal mate. However, if you approach a member of the opposite sex and engage them in a way that doesn't immediately degrade yourself, say by subtly showing that if this interaction doesn't go well, you'll be able to survive and find somebody else, then you're more likely to have a better social interaction with that person. To put it more simply, effective methods of attraction have come from observing human beings for millennia and seeing what works in respect to social cues and body language. However, this game of socialization is so unbelievably complicated. If you were to look at human socializing as a mathematical formula, there would be an infinite number of combinations you can make between words, sentences, tone, body language, eye contact, yada yada yada. It is so complicated that even normal human beings with serviceable social skills have trouble with it on a regular basis. Before I continue, I think now would be a good time to mention that for this video, I'll be speaking about intimate relationships from a primarily male perspective, as I do not believe I have the qualifications to speak about the female perspective. However, if there is a woman out there who has AS and is listening to this video that would be willing to contribute their perspective, getting contact with me through Twitter at Max Derrett and we'll figure out a way for you to offer your perspective on this channel. Speaking as a male, it's especially difficult when the females are the biological limiters of your species, given the fact that they have wombs. For this primary reason and more subordinate reasons, females have the burden and privilege of exercising choice over whom they will partner with. This is why the stereotype exists that men will supposedly have sex with anything that moves. This is one of many reasons why most most women on dating sites rate 80% of the men on those dating sites as having below average attractiveness, whereas the men are a lot less choosy. Women bear a life-changing responsibility if they mate with a man and they conceive a child. In a purely biological sense, if a woman refuses to partner with you, what they are saying is they don't believe your genes should be replicated into the next generation, that you should improve yourself so you can sustain the life of your partner and your children. This is one reason why women make men so self-conscious. This is one reason why many men sometimes respond in unacceptable ways to female rejection. There are obviously other reasons why women would refuse sex and partnership, like I said, I'm just speaking purely biologically. Now I ask you, the viewer, to take everything I said and imagine what it's like for somebody with AS when it comes to seeking out intimate relationships. Given that the courtship game is structured around the social interaction and cues of the average neurotypical human being, where does that leave people with AS? Well, let me me put it this way. Incoming spoilers for the Pixar film Inside Out. At the end of that movie, a young boy meets Riley, the female protagonist. This is what his brain does in the presence of a young girl he finds pretty. And that's what it's like for an average neurotypical young boy. Like I said just a few seconds ago, there's nothing that makes a male more self-conscious and insecure than a pretty female. Now, let's play this video again and assume this young boy has AS. Let's see what's inside his brain.
Okay, maybe I'm being a little bit overdramatic, but not much. In the case of the young boy without AS, he will most likely have the capacity to overcome this anxiety, learn how to socialize with the opposite sex, and learn how to make himself more attractive in the process. In contrast, the boy with AS, if he's lucky, might be able to overcome some of these problems with intense training. But it will be almost impossible to play the courtship game as it has been laid out by neurotypicals. If he is to have any luck at all with the opposite sex, his future partner will have to forgive his eccentricities and quirks while he simultaneously does his best to adapt somewhat to societal standards. However, despite the fact that a lot of us would like to believe we live in a more progressive accepting society nowadays, and that most people would be willing to forgive the quirks of somebody with AS, it does not seem to be the case. For example, one core problem that many people with AS have is expressing emotion. Not feeling emotion, but expressing it. Most people with AS have no problem feeling emotion. One of the most important parts of any relationship is having open communication with your partner regarding how you're feeling. Obviously, if somebody with AS has a tough time expressing emotion, it's hard for the partner to gauge whether or not the relationship is healthy. It's hard for the partner to know if their efforts to make the relationship work are in vain or not. On the flip side, people with AS have a hard time interpreting the body language of their partner. If my partner isn't happy, for example, unless she tells me that she's unhappy or I did something wrong, then it's likely nothing will be done to solve the issue. In most of my past relationships, my partner wouldn't tell me what I did wrong if I did something wrong, and they used their silence as a form of punishment for some sort of misdeed I committed. When I found out I did something wrong, I would ask, well, why didn't you tell me so that I could apologize and fix the problem? They would say something like, well, you should have known. And because I can't understand social cues or body language most of the time, when I found out somebody I loved was brooding over something I did, I would beat myself up for being broken and stupid. And when I say beat myself up, I mean literally. Physically. The trauma that came from this self-imposed punishment bled over into my most recent relationship. Even though by her admission I did almost nothing wrong, whenever she would be quiet and introverted and said she was sad, I would immediately retreat to thinking I did something wrong and then fall into a pit of despair, when 99% of the time it was just due to her depression. The worst part however, of having AS and interacting with the opposite sex is the naivety one is plagued with during our teen years. The naivety and innocence I had between the ages of 14 and 18 was akin to that of an orthodox priest. I grew up in a Christian school and my knowledge of sex was limited only to how babies were made. I had no concept of why kissing girls was such a big deal except that you should want to do it. Until I was 15, I just thought girls were mildly annoying. Given the fact that at that age, all of my peers also had their hormones raging and were looking to get with the opposite sex, there were people around me that took advantage of my naivety. Allow me to cite some uncomfortable examples. When I was 15, I found that I had drifted into a social clique that was a mix of drug addicts, alcoholics, sexually active musicians, members of the LGBT community, and other outcasts. I wasn't any of those things except for being somewhat of an outcast because with my autistic temperament, I didn't fit into any particular category. At the time, I was handsome, athletic, I played several instruments, I was mysterious on account of me rarely opening my mouth, but I was nevertheless kind and considerate when I did. I didn't know at the time that all of these things made me a hot commodity to my female peers because like I said, I had no concept of what sexuality was beyond the act of intercourse, let alone regular social interaction. This wasn't just because nobody explained to me what it was all about. I understood it was important, but because I had AS, I wasn't interested in trying to figure it out, nor did I understand why it was important. It would be like trying to explain why turning the light on in a dark room is important to a blind person. At the time, because I didn't speak much and when I did, I was very amiable and easy to talk to, my autistic symptoms weren't immediately obvious to many people, although they were later on. However, my social awkwardness did come about when girls started openly talking about risque topics. Forgive my crass language, but oftentimes I would hear them talking about giving head or getting shit-faced, and I had no idea what those terms meant. I didn't know until I was 16 when a good friend of mine explained it to me. On the one hand, I wasn't made fun of for my naivety at first, but rather the girls around me for whatever reason found my innocence charming. Unfortunately, because I was completely ignorant about sexuality, social conventions, cues, and body language, some girls took it upon themselves to, let's say, educate me. And what do I mean by that? Well, on a frequent basis, I was being sexually harassed 
and I didn't even know it. It didn't help that I was a man and I had no concept in my mind that guys could be sexually harassed because I was always taught that only the reverse was true. If it happens to guys, we're supposed to feel lucky. However, in my case, I didn't even know what I was supposed to feel. Girls would kiss me without my permission, they would push themselves against me, sit on my lap, several different girls would take my hands and put them on their breasts, and sometimes they would make me put my hands on other girls' chests. On a couple of occasions, I had girls either grab my rear end or slap it. This happened on a regular basis among seven different girls for over a year, maybe even two years. Like I said, if it happens to guys, we're supposed to feel grateful or lucky, right? However, in my case, I didn't even know what I was supposed to feel. I just let it happen because I would freeze in place, not knowing what to do, not knowing what the hell was going on. As I grew older and wiser, I started to understand what exactly was going on. It wasn't until the last year of my high school career that I realized what people really thought of me. Up until then, I had been living in an ignorant trance, thinking I was well-liked and respectable. However, there were several incidents in grade 12, and somewhat in grade 11, that made this veil fall down before my eyes. I remember that for my grade 12 drama exam, we had to impersonate a famous actor. I, along with some of my other classmates, were having trouble picking an appropriate actor or actress. I remember that a guy named Mark openly suggested I impersonate John Malkovich. Upon his suggestion, every voice in that classroom exclaimed, in unison, Yeah! When they all said this, it was so loud and in such harmony that I almost jumped out of my seat. I didn't know who John Malkovich was, nor did I know he was famous for playing a lot of creepy characters and bad guys. So when I audibly asked aloud to my classmates, oh, why do you think he'd be good? Around five or six girls in perfect unison responded, because you're so creepy. They said this while my teacher was in the room and she didn't protest. I was so embarrassed that and angry that I semi-audibly replied, well, a few too. This is just one of many incidents. I realized that girls were questioning my behavior behind my back, calling me weird and creepy because of my blank stares, my lack of eye contact, the fact that I rarely ever spoke, etc, etc. Upon learning that my problems were on account of having AS, I was so angry and depressed that I actively separated myself from almost all of the women I had been around for the past four years, save for a couple of exceptions. I hated them. I hated the fact that nobody said anything to me that I was acting odd and I had to find it all out inadvertently. It was like uncovering some big government conspiracy that was actually true. I know I sound paranoid, but I'm actually not. I could tell you about each individual that I found out was making fun of me or was actually scared of me because of how I presented myself and how I found out. However, for the sake of privacy and time, I won't share those details here. And to this day, I am still so paranoid about my interactions with people. Whenever I finish talking to somebody in person, I turn away and my face cringes because I think to myself, oh my god, did they think I was weird? Did I hide my traits well? Going from high school to university, these problems didn't stop happening. A few girls I tried to talk to and be nice to were put off by the fact that I didn't look them in the eye, that I didn't know when to stop talking about topics of my interest, that I couldn't tell when they were uncomfortable or not enjoying themselves. I would go into greater detail, but at the risk of greater embarrassment, I'll save you all the graphic details. Even though we've come to the conclusion, I still have so many different stories involving my failures in the pursuit of intimate relationships and the opposite sex. What I have shared with you is only 10% of my history of romantic misfortune. Instead of going on for another two hours with that, I'll leave you all on a positive note. I know some people have criticized me for not offering methods for people to rise above their AS symptoms in these videos. In response to that, I would like to propose an idea. I was thinking that because I have had recent success in respect to intimate relationships, I could hold a regular live stream where people could ask me questions about a particular subject and I could offer advice on what has worked for me. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Before I conclude, I need to say the following to my fellow AS havers. If any of what I said sounds familiar to you, I highly recommend you seek out a diagnosis. Don't lie to yourself about your inadequacies. Lying never leads anywhere good. You never get away with it. Coming to terms with your limitations while painful is a much healthier alternative to what almost happened to me. To my listeners who don't have AS, instead of offering your sympathies, I'd much rather you share this video to spread awareness. Share it with somebody who might know an AS sufferer. That way, they can save themselves from unnecessary trauma and live a much more fulfilling life. Before you go, I also want to direct you all to a test 
in the description box below called the Autism Spectrum Quotient. If you think you might have AS or know somebody who does, make sure the relevant person or people take this test. It's not an official diagnosis and should not be treated as such. It's mostly just to help encourage people to seek out diagnoses so they can get the resources that they need. Until next time, my fellow Aspergians, just remember, you deserve to be happy.